Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, if I can get this thing to work, I am going to say something about um, the ethics of uh, research, the ethics of science, whether, it, whether it's open or not. Uh, and I think that the, the, um, the time that we're in now is, uh, um, for research, is always a time of transition and always uh, a time of change, but I think it's more so now than for most other phases that we've been through in the last uh, few decades. Let's see. Um, there you go. So, first the good side, the, uh, um, the notion of uh, sharing data, of open data. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing and it's been made possible in a way that it wasn't earlier due to technology. And also we have more data due to uh, technology and the use of it. And data sharing uh, is really the only way to go. Uh, these are three alternative R's. Uh, it's rational. It makes sense to share data. Uh, it would not make sense not to share them. It's reasonable. It's fair. There's been a lot of talk about haves and have-nots uh, in, in, in science. And the more you can share data, the better in that way. And it's resource efficient. It's not that uncommon that the same sort of job is done several times uh, at increased cost by different, uh, different uh, institutions and different researchers, and that's just irrational. So I think for all of these reasons, the idea of data sharing uh, is, it, it's not just that it's a good idea, it's rather that not doing it uh, would be doing something wrong. It's actually more or less an obligation to share, to share data. And going back to the sort of the ethics of this, what's the, what's the basis for um, for, for sharing, I think looking at the internal standards of science will help us to sort of spell out more what we're already feeling, that this is a, a good thing and a good idea. Uh, and to my mind, the best articulation of the sort of ethos of science uh, was made uh, during the 1940s by, by Merton, his KUDOS acronym. Um, it's sort of extra cool for a nerd because KUDOS also means sort of repute in ancient Greek. Um, but what it stands for as an acronym is communalism, universalism, disinterestedness, and organized skepticism as a sort of expression of the basic value uh, internal to science to the extent that it works properly. Now, communalism, which he originally called communism, but he had to alter the word in, in face of the you know, McCarthy hearings and so on. Uh, communalism is just the idea that, that uh, whatever is done in research is, is shared. So we would go for data, for hypotheses, for arguments, for criticism, and so on. Universalism also adds the, the, the notion that it doesn't really matter who said it. What's important is whether it's well put. So the, the idea is that, you know, ideally, it's actually the argument or the, or the quality of the research that counts and not where it came from. This was, of course, a, in, a, in some ways a much bigger issue uh, at the time during the 40s than, than, it, than it is today, but it's still a good thing to be reminded of. Then disinterestedness does not mean, in this context, uh, that you don't really care about your job. It's, it, in a way, it's almost the opposite. It's a Kantian notion of a disinterestedness, which means that you're not just in it for fame, glory, and the money. You're, you're, you're actually in it because you're looking for truth, you're looking for knowledge, you're, you're part, of, part of that kind of, of an enterprise. Organized skepticism, finally, is sort of the, the way that science works when it works well. It's, uh, it's the very notion that if you're just doing it on your own, you're, you might be having a good time, but it's probably not science. Uh, it's only by the fact that scientific activity is a shared activity. Uh, it's an activity where people criticize each other, build on each other, uh, uh, and agree and disagree in an organized, rational manner. It's only to the extent that this is going on that we're having science at all and not something else. Uh, of course, in real, uh, uh, in real life, none of these are ever perfectly realized. We, I'm sure most of you have thought of, of ways in which um, other forces will work in another direction and so on. But these are still sort of ideals that I think are, are, are um, sufficiently central so that if you take them completely away, you take away science. Th there, can, there cannot be science or research without these, these values playing some, some part. 
The importance of, of, of this when it comes to sharing data uh, has to do also with the, the, the simple fact of validating existing research. It's often very difficult to see the quality of research if you don't know the data behind it. I mean, just for that fact, you need some access to other people's data. Uh, otherwise, and also methodologies like algorithms, otherwise you don't really know whether their research is valid at all. So, so that's a very central, uh, central um, uh, issue. Now, this is a bit of source code, really. I mean, you've all seen probably loads of different research ethics guidelines uh, in, your, in your careers so far. Uh, some of them can be sort of fit into one sheet of paper, others fill up entire books. But what they all have in common, the source code, the basis for it all, is this. Uh, so different uh, committees find different ways of sort of hiding, uh, hiding the racing, but this is really what it's all about. Uh, three basic principles in relation to the people that you're doing research on or with in social research or in, in medical research or, or biological research. There's the idea of good consequences. Does this research make uh, an impact to make the world better or worse, or is it just indifferent? The idea of good consequences and uh, avoiding bad ones uh, is one completely central and irreducible ethical dimension of research. The second one uh, is respect for persons. Now, that's not reducible to good consequences if you think of that as a, as a purely sort of um, general way, so it needs to be lifted up as a separate uh, principle. The idea that when you relate to persons, you have to relate to them as persons, that is to say, as beings who should have a say in matters that pertain to their own lives, uh, beings uh, who should be able to make up their own minds about things that affect them. And thirdly, justice, which is also figured in, in, in all research ethics guidelines, at least since the Belmont report of, of the 1970s, uh, it can be, this is the most vague of them all, it can be used in very many different ways. The basic uh, way in which it was thought originally was that the people who participate in research and the people who benefit from it should, ha should be in some kind of relation. So if you're, if you're doing, a re a, let's say, clinical um, um, uh, trials, uh, and you're doing all the dangerous testing on a development uh, on a population from a developing country, and the the results will only be available to people in uh, rich people in rich countries. You have a problem with justice, basically. That's the, so, the, so these are the three things that you can now go back and look at different research ethics guidelines, and this is what you'll find spelled out in uh, so many words. Okay, now. Um, <clears throat> When it comes to social science and uh, medical science and some other branches as well, there is a particular uh, challenge, namely that the data that, we're, that we should at the outset be sharing is data about people. It's personal data. And that, in a way, is a game changer. It really changes everything in, as far as how we need to think about that data. Um, you probably, most of you know the, the sort of um, the traditional grouping of data. Uh, you have personal data, then you have the notion of de-identified data, which means that, uh, as seen by the researchers getting access, he or she will not be able to tell whose data this is, which persons, but there is a key, uh, so you can re-identify what has been de-identified. Then there's a special grouping of data within the pers personal data that's called sensitive data. Uh, not all regulations uh, include this, but I think most, most national laws uh, will have a special group of, of kinds of data that are, that are considered sensitive, like th things having to do with uh, health, uh, religion, uh, uh, sexuality, politics, uh, those kinds of issues. Then there's anonymized data, which traditionally has been the way to skip all the um, all the legal and a lot of the ethical issues. If you manage to anonymize data, uh, you're sort of safe. And it's because if it's really anonymized, it's no longer personal data. So any kind of privacy law, any kind of, of, um, of uh, personal data jurisdiction just sort of drops off the table immediately. Now, the situation today is very different than it uh, was previously. And I think big data, what we these days call big data, is sort of... Uh, 
the easiest way of seeing this challenge. In the old system, I'm over, oversimplifying now, clearly, but that's the only way to get this through in, in, uh, in 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, in, the, in the old system, what you needed to do to see if a data set was anonymized was simply to look at the data set. That was a sort of the standard. You could see if enough stuff had been deleted, you were left with, uh, with, a, with a, uh, an anonymized set. And you could sort of, uh, with a trained eye, you could more or less uh, judge this. Today, with the reality of so much data being collected uh, on each and every one of us, thousands of data points every day, even if, you have a, even if you're having a quiet day, uh, and it's all of, all of it being um, uh, stored as a default rather than, uh, rather than deleted, uh, and the existence of so many centers or holders of data, this is very different because what you now have to do in order to see if something is anonymized is to look at the rest of the data in the world, not just the set that you're holding on to, because any putatively anonymized data set may be sort of paradoxically, uh, re-identified by comparing it or coupling it with other data sets. So that what looks like it's th th there's no way back to the person, or in some cases perhaps a small group, a small minority group that, that might also get, uh, uh, get, get in trouble. Um, but if you, collect, if you combine it with other set sets of data, all of a sudden uh, what you thought was anonymized is no longer an anonymized. And I think that big data is just sort of uh, a premonition of this, uh, what we're now calling, calling big data. This is a, si uh, a new situation. And even very professional uh, agents in the field have made mistakes here. They've thought that their data sets were anonymized, and they've just made a mess of it. And it turned out that some teenager uh, with his computer managed to re-identify data in a matter of you know, just the afternoon. So data sharing, then. Uh, in face of this um, means that we have to consider the fact that the, the, the research project life cycle and the life cycle of the data are no longer traveling together in the way that they generally used to be. The classic idea of data is that you sort of you, you amass your own data. When you have enough, you do your research, and then you either delete it or you let someone else hold on to it, or you just you know you hold on to it secretly or whatever. But uh, today, uh, that's no longer the case. The, the data invariably comes with a history, and it goes on having a history after your project. So there's no, there's no simple match between the, the project and the, the data anymore. And this means that we have a ver much more intricate and, and confused situation when we're going to evaluate what could happen to the data uh, in, in different kinds of, of um, um, uh, combinations. And I think even that some of the basic principles of all privacy uh, law previously, like minimality, it's just, there's no way to, at least I see no way of really making sense of minimality in the face of big data. Minimality is as that you, you need sort of, um, generally you need a specified purpose uh, for what data you're holding. Uh, you, you only hold on to the necessary bits and pieces. But this is not the way that things are done uh, anymore. So, uh, a lot of the work uh, can be done by ensuring good consequences. There are many ways in which to ensure good con consequences, which in this context means primarily safety uh, and, and security uh, for the, uh, concerning the data, so that there is no risk of abuse, there is no risk of re-identification, there is no, no risk of anyone uh, having either as research participants or as just people, like we, we all are, uh, having some, some of this come back and hit them in the face. This is just one way of doing it. Uh, I'm not trying to sell that uh, solution, but it's, it's just one developed way of thinking about safety uh, when it comes to, um, to consequences. Uh, so it's the, the UK data, data service, five safe. Sa safe people, uh, if, you, if you want access to the, to the data, you need some kind of training, vetting, approval. Uh, you don't get it just because you're, uh, you call yourself a researcher. You, you get access only after you've had some kind of training so that you know what you're doing. Uh, second, safe projects. There's an, an ethics evaluation of the project to see whether it's, uh, whether it's satisfactory in the, in the required respects. Then there's the idea of safe data, that, that the data is, 
um, um, is such that there's a minimized risk of disclosure. The safe environment, uh, in their case, acts as only in, in securely assured locations, and safe outputs, because sometimes even the publications uh, can, can reveal more than you, more than you thought. Now, uh, here comes my sort of main message and, and main point and, and main difficulty, is that you can have all the good consequences in the world, that you can have all the safety in the world, but it does not add up to respect for persons. You can, you can imagine a world where everything is taken care of, so everything is hunky-dory the whole way, but if people don't have a say in what's happening to their own data, if people don't have any kind of, of, of say in, in the whole process, you've lost respect for persons along the way. And it's irreducible. You cannot do this just by saying that it's safe. Don't worry, just walk on. There's nothing to see here. That's just not the right way to, to do it because, because respect for persons, having persons be, being able to decide for themselves is uh, irreducible here. The, the way of ensuring that you sort of can tick the respect for persons uh, bit uh, off in your form has always been and is uh, today um, consent. It's sort of the, the default way of doing it. Uh, it's not an unproblematic way. Uh, I think in very many cases, perhaps most cases, it's somehow abused. But it, but it is a way that we have not, we have not found, uh, found another way of, of securing respect for persons uh, that works like this. Uh, the idea of consent then, of course, is only, is only viable if the consent is informed and if it is um, voluntary. So consent that's not informed is not consent. It's just saying whatever or saying, yeah, uh, I don't know. Um, if, if you're not informed about what's this for, uh, is there any risk for me? Um, uh, who's paying for this, by the way? Um, is it going to go on for a long time? If you don't know any of this information, you cannot consent. You may perhaps nod or you may sign your name or whatever, but that's not consent. Consent requires that you, that you have a basis for making up your mind. Um, similarly, with, with uh, it being voluntary, um, and here we have many different uh, degrees, of course. Uh, you don't have to be sort of threatening someone with, with violence in order to, to undermine uh, voluntariness. Uh, any kind of pressure is problematic in this kind of, this kind of, se uh, of setting. So the, the standard replies now, I'm just going to go through them uh, and suggest that, it's, uh, that this is not necessarily so. Sorry if the, if the writing is uh, slightly small. Can you, can you read it back there? Yeah? Well, some nodding. Some, some can read it. Um, so f the, the first one is just the, the idea that it's unnecessary. But like I said, that's the wrong answer because respect for persons is not reducible to good consequences. So uh, it's not unnecessary in that way. Impractical is also a very common reply, but that's starting in the wrong end. That's putting uh, the cart before the horse. Uh, if it's impractical, that doesn't do anything uh, because you have to start by evaluating the research. Is this research so important, so excellent, that it's, that it's, that it's okay to drop the rule for once? That's the way to ask a question, not, not whether it's impractical for any given research project. Because mind you, I'm not advocating sort of all research being, being uh, um, consent-based. Uh, that's not feasible and it's never been the case. But uh, I'm just trying to point out that if, we're, if we have a significant re reduction in, in consent, uh, then we have a significant reduction in respect for persons, and that's a problematic thing. Third, that is simply um, unworkable. That's usually just because uh, uh, the researchers or the institutions have not been doing this in the right, uh, the right way. You've all seen so-called consent forms that go look like old-fashioned sort of uh, phone books, you know, with... Uh, with, uh, that just go on for, for miles and miles as you, as you, if you bother to scroll do down at all instead of just saying okay. Now that's not really consent. Uh, that's a way of getting what you want. And I think that's one of the most basic misunderstandings when it comes to consent. The, this sort of belief that consent is there to cover the researchers' ass or to cover the, the, the institution's ass. It isn't. Consent is not a, uh, primarily a way of securing uh, the institution against um, uh, um, court cases and expenses. It's just a way of promising something, a formalized way of promising 
that you'll take care of things in the right way and of, of inform, informing people of, about what's, what's going to happen and allowing them to, to choose. And most consent forms, the way they look today, are clearly not made with that in, in mind. They're, 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 made with, with, uh, they're made by lawyers for lawyers, uh, basically, and not, uh, not, with the, not with the idea of, of informing people in a, in a decent manner. The way that this works today, uh, it's been estimated that if we all, just in our sort of everyday lives, were to read all the so-called consent forms that we have to um, uh, agree to just to use apps, uh, do whatever we do, it would take about one month out of each year for each of us to read those things. Of course we don't do that, you know. Uh, I, I don't think I've read one of those things in years now. It's, it's just, uh, it's just n not feasible the, the way that it's working today. Um, finally, uh, impossible? No, it's not impossible. Uh, it used to be much more impossible uh, a generation ago. Uh, with today's technology, it's actually easier than it's ever been to, to ensure, uh, to, to uh, obtain, as it's called, uh, obtain consent. Finally, um, this does not mean that it's realistic to do so on the level of the single research project always. I mean, if, you, if you're getting access to data to uh, run through, say, two, three million um, people, with each with countless data points, uh, it's not realistic and it's not right to necessarily to, ha to ensure that that project does a separate run of consent with two million people. I think that, again, uh, what we need to do is to just use this time, this time of transition, to take very seriously uh, the idea of changing things from a, on a higher level. I think there is an analogy here with the idea of, of open access. Open access was met with exactly these same kinds of, of replies for years and years and years. Uh, this sort of just buffed off as just, that's unrealistic, that's naive. And it is naive if you think that the, that the, the single researcher sitting in her little cell is going to uh, just put her publications out on her website and of actually getting points for, for publishing internationally. That's, of course that's unrealistic and only a few very idealistic people would do so. Even on the level of the institution, it's fairly unrealistic. But notice what happened with, with open uh, access. Everyone says it's unrealistic, then at, if the level of the EU says, uh, let's go open access, everyone's going open access, it's sort of almost overnight. Not that it's perfect now, not that it's completely implemented, but I think that thinking in terms of uh, how we can ensure consent in a decent way requires an initiative on that kind of that kind of level. Also, that it's technologically feasible, I think. And again, I'm not advocating this particular brand of solution um, uh, over others, but just as an example, uh, Alex Pentland's uh, open uh, um, data new data initiative uh, from he, he's at MIT is an example of a sort of illustration of it not being entirely unrealistic. Now, he has a view of, of personal data that's pretty close to sort of um, the way we now are used to thinking about money. So we have the same problem with money. Uh, we, need, we need some way of, of ensuring that, uh, you know, all of, your, um, uh, all of your different funds and all of your different expenses and all of your different relations, different people must be coordinated somehow by some kind of entity that could do this properly. And some people might say that's just very naive, you know, you, c you can't, that's not, it's not possible, it's very, very difficult uh, to do that kind of thing. Well, they're called banks, you know. Yeah, yeah. and that's sort of, uh, that's sort of the, the, the mindset of, of, of uh, uh, this particular initiative, is to say, well, we need something like a bank for personal data, some kind of, of way of, uh, of taking care of it and b giving people the level of information that they want, so that you could choose, for instance, uh, uh, down to a sort of very detailed level, uh, uh, knowing what's happening with your data, with, with the different data sets that you're part of. You could just, you could also choose the sort of I don't care, but I get to, I get to find out if I want to uh, um, uh, approach. This is just to, to mention one way of, 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 of doing it. There is a sort of halfway house between letting everything go and um, and uh, holding on to respect for people in the in the in the full sense, and that's just trust. Not any kind of uh, uh, trust, not the kind of trust that children have for their parents, which should be sort of blind and, and, and uh, uh, without conditions, 
but a sort of reasoned trust. So in other words, not really trust, but we call it trust because it's nicer. Uh, trust in the, uh, in the sense of you having a reason uh, to, to, um, to let uh, the researchers or the, the office or the department or whatever handle your personal data. And I think that's, that's on the level of trust here, the, the idea of reason trust uh, is, uh, is, is a, a very important way to go, but it doesn't bring us all the way to, uh, to respect for persons uh, all the same. So summing up, data sharing, uh, yes please, of course, uh, open data uh, at the outset, it would be uh, sort of weird not to uh, in several ways, uh, but then there's the, the, the challenge of, of uh, re-identification. We can handle a lot of that by, by ensuring good consequences. Uh, but then there's still this notion of respect for persons, which has traditionally been um, performed by informed consent. And that's the, the thing that we need to hold on to and not let, let go uh, in this uh, time of transitions. So no degree of just simple security or safety uh, can, can handle the idea of respect for persons. So summing up, then, we should not let opportunity lead to lessening of respect. Thank you. Thursen Duck, Professor Fosheim, thank you very much. Message wall is active. You have created lots of quotes here. That's nice. How can we really make people understand the real risks and benefits in the age of Trumpism and disdain of knowledge? Understanding written language is not easy if the presumption is that professionals are not to be trusted. Well put, message wall. We, we will be taking your questions, questions from the audience in just a little while here, so if you have any questions, think of them now and be ready to ask for the microphone. But uh, before we do that, we will hear some comments from Lena Surpa, who is research director at Finnish Youth Research Networks. I will be here because I'm quite, quite short that you can see me and I can see you. Uh, good morning, good day, everybody. I'm Lena Surpa and I'm very, very grateful for, for, for the invitation. Uh, hey, alla nordiska kollegor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Halvard Fosheim, for your insightful and very interesting and I think very important uh, thoughts uh, related to, to the openness of science and its, its relationship to, to the research ethics. I think it is a particularly important theme to be discussed here. And as Harvard pointed out, openness of the science is a topical issue today, but it's also a universal scientific virtue. It's something which has always been a part of, of science. So it's a universal, it's embedded in every single academic work, regardless of time and place. Openness is closely linked uh, with the security and insecurity of scientific data, but also, and even more importantly, with the daily life of academic scholars in the contemporary world, both in the Nordic countries, in Europe, and throughout our globe. And in this commentary speech, I would like to bring up to the floor uh, the freedom of exp expression as one particularly topical and fragile condition of open science, being also linked with a debate on research ethics taken up by Halward uh, a couple of minutes ago. At the same time as academic scholars are demanding to conform the rules related to open science, the environments in which the academic world uh, work is done have become increasingly insecure, in many ways even dangerous. Insecurity is not a new phenomenon in an academic field, but it has been escalated because of global tensions and because of the digitalization of public discussion in which academic community is an important part, both as an actor and as uh, as a victim. We live in a paradoxical world uh, where censorship meets seemingly open digitalized media environment and they both restrict the freedom of science in 
serious ways. And I take very briefly in three minutes four points uh, to, to, to uh, somehow summarize this, this, this sad development. Uh, one threat uh, linked with the freedom of expression of, of the scientific uh, field is that scientific scopes, themes, methods, data and publication every arenas may become increasingly narrow. Contested phenomena and unprejudiced ways of doing academic world work become more marginalized in the situation in which an increasing amount of researchers exper experience daily threats. The result may be that the researchers avoid taking any risks, which I see as a very important condition of open thought and conse consequently also for open science. There has been a lot of discussion of self-censorship of the artists. I think the same discussion concerns also the field of researchers. Secondly, if the researchers restrict themselves to the safe comfort zones, there is a risk that the research communities become more alienated of the complex world that they should analyze and give advice to. The alienation in its turn may imply that the recognition of scientific knowledge diminishes, likewise, its societal impact. And it will be seen as an act of an elitist group, the stereotype which is already now rather strong. Thirdly, this is a sad development for the open science, as well as for the open community of scientists. Open discussion regarding scientific work can be seen as a prerequisite for the innovation and for the development of our academic life, but also for our societal life and a good life of the academic scholars. Fourthly, increasing security of academic communities is a worldwide phenomenon. It's not a Finnish phenomenon, it's not a European phenomenon only. We hear every day about persecuted and imprisoned researchers in Turkey, in Egypt, in Russia, you name it. Regardless of whether we look at the insecurity of the research communities as an offense against human rights or as a threat to the fulfillment of open science and open data at the top research level, we can't let the individual researchers to face this problem alone or to react only to the individual cases. The responsibility for the freedom of expression of the research communities as, an instrument, as, a, as a part of open science should be seen as collective. So finally, that's why I'm very grateful for any attention that has been paid in Finland and elsewhere to this matter. As one promising example from Finland, I would like to raise up the collaboration between scientific communities, the Committee for Public Information in Finland, which is, which is an expert body uh, attached to the Ministry of Education and Culture, and Finnish PEN, which is a part of the International Association of Writers Promoting Freedom of Expression. A particular committee for the academic scholars has been planned to the, be implemented within the framework of Finnish PEN in order to support the freedom of expression of the scientific communities as one important condition of the open science. I really hope this kind of uh, collaboration, democratic, open collaboration, could be further developed also at the Nordic level and at the European level. I think that the responsibility for the freedom of expression of the researchers and scientific communities is a human, human right, uh, universal human right, and this is a global responsibility we should take for for the develop development of this kind of openness as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lena Surpa, Research Director for the Finnish Youth Research Ner Network. So, uh, the clock is 20 past 11 and we will have be having a, a short refreshment break in, a, in a just a little while, but before that, now it's time for me to turn over the mic to you. Anyone here in the audience who wants to, to ask a question? So now, now you should, 
should use that opportunity. We have the microphone waiting here. Do we have anyone who wants to, if you want to ask in Finnish or Swedish, it's quite okay. Voitte kysyä myös suomeksi, niin kan fråga också på svenska, så det översättar jag frågan sen. Here we have someone who wants, so please introduce yourself and ask your question. Thank you. My name is Lisa Evert, coming from the University of Turku. I'd like to ask from Mr. Bergelman if Commission has any uh, thoughts about uh, the merits for the scientists of opening data, uh, opening research materials, what kind of uh, academic merits they could achieve from that. Still me, yeah. So uh, I can answer in Flemish if you want. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, please, I can translate. <laughs> so no, so can. thanks for your question, because um, I, I, as you can imagine, there is a lot of stories behind these slides, so I, and I was only given 25 minutes, so I cannot say everything. But your point is actually one of the most important drivers for open science. There are, there are two, I think, two to three very important reasons why we need to support it, regardless of the emotions. First of all, it's, it's, uh, it's the best way to justify our public spending on research. It's public money, so it should be publicly available at all levels of the cycle. Secondly, it allows better, what your, your, your question, it allows better uh, research because you can reproduce it. And you can, you, can, you can use the data already available, so you have a shortcut to better data if you go in that direction. Your research can be tested at all levels of the cycle because you put it in an open way, so you can bring in uh, different, uh, different other peers if you want. And as a result, you can assume that the research process will be better and certainly faster. If, if, if I made my PhD in, in, in the prehistoric times uh, before the computer, you know, you, you, you go to your promoter, then you get a, a topic, you go to the library, six months later you come out of the library and you, because you have read everything and then you have a question. Now you can do that now in three days. You post a question on ResearchGate, on Mendeley, on Figshare, and, and in the evening you know more or less the state of the art. I'm making a shortcut here, but uh, I'm, I'm not giving any preference for these companies, by the way, conflict of interest, but, uh, but, but that, that's the point. So the merits for research is that it, is, it allows you for better, faster, and more pertinent research also to work in a much more cross-disciplinary way. Of course, the big issue, and that's why I said this about the rewards, Will this be translated into your career opportunities? That's the big issue. That's the incentive point. If, if, uh, because we talked a lot with the young researchers at all levels, at all associations, and over and over again we got the same comment. Yes, it is good, but if I give it, what is under, if I make my data open, first of all, uh, will, will I get the credit? And secondly, will my university recognize it because I have to do an effort to, to make the data uh, accessible in the, f in, the, in the fair principles. So there you, s you see that if we don't solve that issue, and that is an issue of universities, that this is something nor the ministry nor the commission can nor should resolve, but if, if, if universities don't translate openness and open science as an element in the career track, it, it, it will take time. But I personally think that, uh, if I speak too long, please tell me, huh? because I can go on a whole day on this. Huh? <laughs> So <laughs> if, if I personally think in 10 years' time these things will have changed fundamentally, because, for example, you already see now uh, journals on data. You see, you see initiatives, when, when I presented the cycle, you see initiatives where the, 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 the data production that you do as a researcher is being valued and is being assessed. So you can very well imagine that in 10 years' time, just like you have research teaching professor or statistic professors, you will have data producing professors. Because you are so good in making data, and it, they are used so many times that it is used as, a, as an indicator of your scientific quality, just as much as it is in used uh, a, an article in Nature as your indicator. It's not a coincidence that all big publishers are increasingly developing platforms to keep track of, of, of data production and so on. So I think that is, uh, it, it, it is, it is, you know, it is a system thing, eh? it goes together. One will not change if the other change. So the, the, the question is who will first break the circle? But if universities would, would start making incentives, 
if funders keep pushing for it, uh, the Bill Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, if you don't go for open access in data in, and in publishing, you don't, get, you don't get the fund anymore. So you will see it changing very quickly. The commission will, from next year onwards, make it mandatory. So the, the cycle is, is, is increasing. Can I say something? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> no, because I, 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 quite, I, was quite li I quite liked your, your um, this, the, 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 the point raised by the previous speaker on, on trust. I really think that the trust of personal data and, and can we trust the use of our data is precisely one of the main reasons for the Open Science Cloud, to, to provide a, a, a trusted environment where you know that your data are used in an ethical slash research uh, justified way and I think that is a key bottleneck if if that is not the ambition of, of the science cloud and I'm looking to some of my accolades here <laughs> if that is not one of our key ambitions it's not only about faster science but it's also about trusted use of science if we cannot guarantee that and technologically the I think we can do it we, we have missed our our uh, one of our of our main uh, main ob objectives that that we allow that the data of a hospital in south of Spain are used by researchers in Finland and that the people, in the patients in, and, and the administrators in the south of Spain know that it is done in a way that they would do it as well because the, 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 the Open Science Cloud offers you the, the protocols and the format to do it in a way that is accepted at, at the European level. So that is really an, an important target. Thank you very much, Jean-Claude Burgerman. So, uh, does anyone else? Have a question here. We have one. Well, Thomas, Thomas Wilhelmsson, Chancellor of the University of Helsinki. Thank you very much for a, a very interesting analysis of, of, of the issue of research, or this part of research ethics in, 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 in the new mm -hmm. situation. I, I uh, and, and uh, when, you, when you employ those principles, of course, you end up uh, in a lots of different difficult balancing situations and ethical argument which we are used to dealing with on a national level and we have very var various systems for nationally discussing where, where the limits of, of ethics are to be drawn. How before, before you get your big international banks in place, how shall we deal with, with the fact that, that with open science we had we had one solution mentioned here here, but how do you see more generally with, with, with open science kind of open opening up data internationally? How shall we deal with 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 these ethical questions which which arise in a in a way that we keep the trust globally? Well, thank you. Actually, I do have a very simple answer to this. I just did the long route earlier uh, for fun. No, I, it, it is a very difficult situation. Uh, and it's one that's not really solved in the abstract, I think. Uh, but one thing that's absolutely crucial now is that with these real changes going on on the level of research, there must be corresponding changes on the level of ethical reflection. Uh, so if there is the de, de facto um, global international uh, sharing of data or within a certain zone, something will have to be put in place so that there's no doubt who's, uh, who's responsible, who's going to fix this, and who's, uh, who's to blame if it goes wrong. That's sort of, uh, I think that we, we, uh, we need, to, need to ensure that there is a system for, for these things so that it do doesn't sort of get out of hand more than it has to. That's at least part of the part of, of, of my, my response. 